Well, good afternoon and good morning, depending on uh, which part of the world you're listening from today. Um, those regular attendees amongst you will notice we've changed the format a little bit uh, this month um, on the latest OEG webinar. We're holding just one webinar today uh, rather than uh, the normal two that we run. And we're going to attempt to cover um, a broad range of topics and geography. So it would be great to get your feedback, uh, those of you who, who tune in regularly on whether this works for you. Um, so you can either let us know in the chat function or you can contact OEG directly with your feedback. So back to business. Um, we're looking today at current trends in um, uh, global aviation. And where are leisure tra travelers going this summer? Um, most of the world now is in a place where there are not restrictions on travel. So we can talk about travel again, which is amazing. Many of us have been on holiday and have more holidays planned, which is exciting. Um, and in fact, um, we'll talk a bit later about where John Grant is, because uh, he's on holiday uh, right now too. Um, we'll also be looking at um, insights on business travel and whether there are changes in booking patterns. Um, so lots to cover, and as ever, we'll be taking questions as we go. So um, please, uh, drop your questions in the in the chat field, and uh, we'll do our best to deal with those as we um, as we go along. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Deirdre Fulton. Maybe I should have said that at the start. Um, I'm a partner in Midas Aviation, and I've been working closely with OEG for a very long time. Um, and uh, happy to to host um, these webinars regularly. Now I'm pleased to be joined by Becca Rowland, um, who's standing in today for John Grant, um, who is OEG's chief analyst. As I mentioned, um, John's on holiday this week, and we're very much hoping that he is actually enjoying his holiday and not secretly um, listening in to see how we're doing without him. But um, maybe we'll be able to tell uh, if there are some interesting sounding names uh, as participants, or indeed some challenging questions. Um, Becca works very closely with OEG, like myself, and is a regular commentator on industry trends. So welcome, uh, welcome back, Becca. You're not in the host yeah, not, seat for once. I'm not in the host seat, and I'm not sure I can really stand in for John. I think those of uh, our listeners who uh, who regularly uh, tune into the webinars will know that John has a very distinctive um, voice and set of opinions, but uh, I'll do my best. There we are. And lastly, but of course, by no means least, um, we're joined, and I think this is a, a first, uh, Louise, Louise Milan from Forward Keys. Um, he's very involved in understanding traveller behaviour and industry trends and works across the industry to interpret what those trends um, and uh, behaviour, changes in behaviour mean for destinations and travel and aviation industry or organisation organizations right across the globe so welcome uh, Luis thanks for joining us thank you very much for that introduction Deirdre and uh, thank you it's uh, it's an honor to share the stage with you today and uh, I think that we are going to be sharing some good news about the industry in this session perfect um, well we're certainly looking forward to, uh, to, to having the conversation mm -hmm. um, Okay, let's dive right into our first slide. Um, again, for our regular um, uh, viewers, we're just giving our, an update on uh, the global capacity picture. So um, what we can see uh, is that for April, um, as of the data pooled this week, uh, global capacity is sitting still just below um, uh, 2019, so actually 4.2% four, uh, below. Um, next month, the gap is going to narrow and capacity is going to be just less than 2% away from um, 2019. So, you know, recovery is recovery is almost there. And that's just a mere eight and a half million seats. Um, it sounds quite a lot when you when you say it like that, but not in the in the global context, I guess. When we look at um, domestic versus uh, international, um, we all sort of uh, instinctively know that domestic um, capacity really has has recovered um, certainly at a global level although there are still some uh, variances if you dig right down into to country level um, but actually domestic this month is 1.3% uh, above um, April 
and next month um, we can see that that's trending upwards uh, closer to 4%. International traffic, of course, um, still lagging. And quite interesting that there's a, you know, there's a sort of consistent um, pattern. I think we said a, a few months ago that we really weren't expecting to see that go above 2019 um, this year, certainly. And that appears to be bearing out in terms of the capacity picture anyway. Um, we're not expecting that to change really significantly through uh, the summer months. Um, so 12% international capacity uh, below 2019 and the gap narrowing very slightly next month to just uh, just under 10%. Um, Becca, do you have anything to anything to add to the, the kind of global picture? Well, I think it's interesting. It's interesting that we're seeing the international creep back closer to 2019 levels. And I think that's really encouraging. And I think we're, we're seeing a bit more um, international movement in the Chinese market. I know we're going to talk about China a bit later on, which has been, you know, really the big, the single biggest market that's, um, that, that's been holding that back, I guess, in a sense. I think what's interesting when we look at the global number, though, as well, is just this sense that, um, and I know John teases me regularly about, you know, my, my talk about capacity discipline, and it's it feels like the industry's just trying to keep that discipline there through the summer, as if um, they know that there's problems associated with, with adding capacity back too fast. You know, we have lots of issues uh, potentially in Europe with um, industrial action. We have issues on the supply side still. Um, we, I know we have Ishka, who's a regular guest on these uh, webinars. And, and I was reading a, one of their papers, you know, talking about just the, the issues with getting new aircraft and even bringing back parked aircraft because of um, staffing issues at MROs and, um, and, and spare parts and, and so on. So, it's as if the industry sort of holding their breath and saying, can they just keep that capacity discipline going through this summer? You know, we know the fares are high, so we know that a lot of airlines are making some money, which is good, and they're rebuilding their balance books, balance sheets. So, you know, we just need to see that that carry on, really. Um, good news here, obviously, if, if this is China bringing back capacity, um, but we just need to, it, it may be disappointing to people to think that we haven't, by 2023, reached the 2019 levels of capacity, but I think it, at this point in time, it's probably something that we, we need in the industry. And I think our, our prediction was always 2024, wasn't it, at the, at the earliest, um, although um, forecasting uh, could, could, could be aligned with crystal ball gazing, couldn't it, um, yeah, in, in yeah. this industry still. So, OK, let's look at the next slide um, where we're breaking down into the, the regional picture. Um, and I think um, it, that that just sort of bears really um, what uh, you were talking about, Becca. Um, you know, we've got this upwards trend in most regions um, and we've got strong uh, capacity in May um, across um, uh, every, every region. Um, Asia having particularly um, really, really seen strong recovery since um, November actually, but the turn of the year um, where we saw things really change and China uh, begin to reopen. Um, we we spotted uh, we spotted these and um, we think that there's a combination there of just capacity, perhaps not having been filed. Um, uh, we're still seeing in some markets um, a little bit of volatility in in scheduling, and that's. I guess um, back to what you were saying, Becca, in terms of capacity discipline and carriers just trying to still um, gauge um, demand versus uh, versus supply. So um, there's a there's a bit of that going on, and I think there's also when we look at the Middle East, um, there was very strong growth um, in 2019 between um, uh, May and June. That isn't replicated um, this year. There's a there's a much more level uh, le level picture. So, um, uh, you know, as always, when you look at these kinds of trends and numbers, there there can be different things skewing them. Um, but I think on, on the whole, what we're seeing is a a, a positive um, a positive trend, aren't we? 
Yeah, and I think that what's interesting to look at, obviously, this is um, comparing each month with the same month in 2019, but it doesn't tell us the different size of the regions here. And if we look at that, um, uh, the North America line, the green line, you know, really from March onward, it's flat against 2019. So that's the by far the biggest market and um, of the ones that we're looking at here. So that's um, that that really plays into this point of some sort of capacity discipline, I think. Louise, anything uh, anything from you specifically? Something I uh, I would like to highlight from this chart is the fast comeback of uh, seed capacity in the Asian region, and that is actually something that we are seeing uh, when we are now going to be look into the demand side. We see that the recovery of uh, travel demand and uh, in Asia is uh, it's it's doing. It's moving quite fast uh, when we compare it to the pace of recovery that we observed in the last years in other regions. And I think that that's very much linked to this fast uh, recovery of the levels of seed capacity starting from, uh, from November uh, of last year. So uh, that, again, is uh, sending a strong message that uh, one of the key factors for regaining and rebuilding this uh, market activity uh, it's the availability of, uh, of flights of connections and uh, making more accessible and more uh, uh, well uh, like keeping fares under under control so that's one of the major factors to uh, to bring uh, to bring the demand back and to establish the consumer confidence and it's, a, it's a good point. I think I think it's a good point to focus on Asia because I think we've seen that you know Asia's been very slow to recover and now we're seeing quite a rapid recovery. And it's we've been doing these webinars for over three years now, and, and we used to talk quite a lot about all those restrictions that were in place and the rules that were being put in place. And we sort of have forgotten about that here in in Europe. But actually, there's still been quite a few rules in in Asia, and we're seeing those lifted as well now. And that's really helping um, helping travellers. You know, it sends a sort of signal to the market okay to travel um, but it just makes traveling easier as well. I think um, with that in mind I looked back just um, 12 months ago to um, the picture um, versus 2019 for Asia and it, it's kind of easy to forget that there was just 25% of 2019 capacity operating this time last year in, in Asia so and actually now we're at 75% um, of, of 2019 with a view to um, you know, the summer seeing that that position um, uh, get stronger. So that's a that's a dramatic shift, isn't it? A significant um, significant in increase. And I guess the interesting thing, as we come on to some of the other slides we're going to talk about, is um, we've sort of seen this pattern um, in the West of um, revenge travel, lots of VFR traffic, um, everybody who had to travel. Um, you know, making uh, sure that they took the opportunity to do that. And we're now, and we'll come on, I guess, to speculate about what, what we're seeing. Um, but we've, we're still seeing that um, that surge, aren't we, in, in, uh, right across Asia Pacific. Um, and that's going to probably continue for, for a little while, um, a little while longer. Um, I guess at some point we'll, we'll look back and do some comparisons over what, what that surge looked like versus um other other parts of the world i think that could be an interesting uh, an interesting piece of um of insight um did you have had a question come in um just just a, i guess for clarification is capacity different from emplanements i guess emplanements is is passengers capacity is number of seats and um we we mention this quite frequently we often use capacity data because we can have that information going forward. If airlines are selling seats, then um, they've got them in the schedules. And so we can have a, a forward view. And, and one of the reasons it's great to have Lewis with us today is because forward keys also have a view on, on sort of bookings. But if you want to measure how many passengers traveled, um, that's historic data and it's a, a few months older. So we tend to look at capacity here. We know it's not quite the same thing as um, passengers, but, but the trends are often um, in parallel. So um, hope, I hope, uh, both for Linda Lydon, I hope that helps answer that question. If anybody else has questions, please do uh, pop them in the chat and we'll try and take them as we go. Thanks, Becca. Um, OK, let's move on to our, our next slide and talk about holidays, which is uh, what, what everybody wants to talk about. And maybe that's just my opinion. Um, so 
we found an interesting um, there was an interesting piece of content this week from our friend uh, Gary Berman over at the Southeast Asia Travel Show. Um, Gary and Hannah uh, put that together, um, and they just um, gave a sort of interesting perspective in terms of there's optimism right across um, you know right across the region. We're seeing um, there's it's obviously holiday um, season um, uh, in that part of the world. Um, we've got Eid, um, Hari Ra, Lebar Lebaran um, last week, Chinese Labour Day this week. So there are, you know, we're in that sort of um, uh, uh, holiday season where people who um, perhaps don't have a huge holiday entitlement are getting um, are getting days off and planning trips around that. Um, travel in Indonesia is booming. Um, so significant um, VFR travel to celebrate Eid. Um, strong visitor arrivals in Japan, um, in particular being driven by uh, Vietnam and Singapore. Um, and we know that um, China and Japan is, you know, is a, is a market that was growing very strongly pre-COVID. Um, pre so we expect that um, that that market will pick up again soon. Um, Thai um, tourism is growing. Singapore, you know, there's a, there's a list of um, these are all of the things that a year ago, when nobody was going anywhere in, in Southeast Asia, we really wanted to, to see. So it's really encouraging, I think, to, to, to see. I think um, there's still an element for me of this phenomena that um, this is people who have, and this is pent up demand, you know, surge, surge, revenge travel, whatever, whatever we call it. Um, and I wonder to what extent, when a year on from now, maybe we'll have you back, uh, Luis, and, and see, um, you know, to what extent things have normalised or actually are we just seeing, um, you know, a, 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 a return to um, strong growth right, right across this region? Right now, it's a strong pent-up demand, but fundamentally uh, coming from local markets, European markets and uh, North American markets, that's the first uh, like wave of of, uh, of travel that now we are detecting traveling to this region, booking for the summer travel. In terms of reactivation of intra-regional travel, I feel that it's still a bit slow and no surprises about it because uh, we observed uh, in the last years that it takes some time to uh, to um, not only to lay the foundations to uh, reestablish travel in terms of uh, flight connectivity, in terms of uh, fares that are affordable, but also it takes some time to reestablish consumer confidence. And I think that uh, for stimulating regional, intra-regional travel in Asia, that's something that may take some uh, some time. I think definitely this is going to be the year of Asia, the year that we are seeing uh, many Asian destinations coming back to the top uh, top list of uh, most popular destinations. And I think that gradually over the year, we are going to see more and more uh, an increasing activity for uh, outbound travel in this region. First, domestic and intra-regional travel, and at a later stage, long-haul travel, as we observed uh, when uh, other regions started to uh, reopen and reactivate travel after uh, after uh, the COVID-19 restrictions. I guess there's a there's a concern potentially about um, the cost of long haul travel, isn't isn't there? Um, although what's quite interesting, um, and again this is just has a, a UK focus, but there was a survey done um, that the results were produced um, just a couple of weeks ago in the UK, and it was um, spending data from 24 million UK bank accounts. Um, separate question there about, um, you know, uh, what, what access uh, people have to people's spending habits, but there we are, I'm sure all anonymized. Um, but the survey, the analysis found that um, the money spent on flights and holidays um, had risen in 2023, despite the cost of living crisis. Um, and there was something like a 27% jump in package holiday bookings. Um, and for airlines, their, uh, the number of transactions that related to airlines had increased by um, over a third. So, you know, there are some things in there that might be skewing that. So, for example, I think the comparison was against the same quarter of the previous year when um, travel wasn't fully uh, unrestricted. 
Um, and I guess the cost of travel is, is also an impact. You know, it may well be that we're seeing um, a, an increase being driven by the increase in, in, in prices to, to travel. We've, um, we've been doing some analysis this week uh, looking at fare data and it's very clear that this is, you know that there is a there is a jump in fares from where we were um, uh, pre-COVID, um, and I, you know I think anybody who's booked travel recently will have will, will have will have anecdotally seen seen the impact of that too. So I wonder to what extent that will curtail people's ability to travel further. Um, I guess that's offset, isn't it, with the sense that now that um, all restrictions are lifted, we can go where we want and we can do the big trips to the places that we, we, we really want to go to. Oh, uh, Becca, I can't hear you. I apologise, I was on mute. Um, that's that's okay, kind we're of only um, 20 minutes it, in until we got a year it, on mute. It's um yeah, we had a question in from Shu, which is about the Southeast Asian countries and will we see high flight fares cause a decline in demand? And I think what's interesting, if we look at this quote on the slide from um uh, the president of, of Astindo As, As um about Indonesians that I suspect that in um, whereas in Europe, perhaps we uh, we know where we want to go or North America, they know where they want to go. It's not quite the same in terms of substituting one destination for another. But I suspect in Asia, we will see more of that, that if um, if the flight, the destination is too expensive, they will switch destinations. So we may see less of an effect due to high prices in Asia. I don't know. I, I personally have concerns for the summer um, here in Europe and perhaps in North America. We've got a potentially you know, industrial action, we've got a high cost of living. Um, if people are paying a lot more for their fares and then they have disruption, and I know we've got a slide later that talks about some disruptions last summer and the impact on bookings. Um, you, you know, I do wonder what that will do for people's willingness to book the next trip. Um, and, and amongst ourselves, uh, as colleagues, we've all got stories of, of, of travel journeys that have not gone well and where airlines haven't behaved um, particularly well and and I do wonder how that will build up so it's really important this you know capacity discipline being able to actually operate a schedule that they plan to operate this summer is quite important I think particularly in Europe and, and North America in Asia maybe there's a bit more um, there are lots of you know relatively inexpensive destinations and lots of places to go to so maybe we'll see a bit more switching around I think there's a degree of tolerance as well isn't there I think what we saw last summer um, in it, in um, right across Europe and, and North America and Latin America to some extent was a sense that um, yes there are going to be teething problems yes it's a bit difficult everybody got that got that memo no, you know not not to say that people were happy about it but I think people understood the reasons why there were um, there were there was operational disruption my sense is that um, you know if you have a second summer in a row of that sort of disruption happening, um, then we we may see uh, behaviour start to change. Um, I hope not, and and I hope that the combination of capacity discipline, you know, focus on recruitment, um, and all of the good steps that that are being taken right across the industry, um, you know, will be enough to actually make sure that we have a, a you know a, a sort of operational environment that works. Um, because I think it would be hugely damaging for the industry to have another disastrous summer um, in terms of the operational experience. We do feel amongst ourselves though we've had a number of discussions about fares and I guess the consensus is we don't see the fares coming down do we? Certainly not this year. Not anytime soon, not anytime soon. John, John I can hear John uh, in, in, in my head saying um, if you find a good fare book it because um, the chances are if you if you pause or think oh I'll go back and book it later it'll be gone and that's certainly been my experience um, uh, in, in planning travel um, over the last little while. Um, okay let's move on to our next uh, next slide which is a little bit of a, 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 a sideways when we're putting this, these slide decks together um, we often um, don't always predict where the conversation is going to go but I guess indicative of the recovery um, that's happening. We saw this week United announce um, and uh, kudos to um, 
uh, one of the many analysts on LinkedIn who um, posted about this uh, this story and drew my attention to it certainly. Um, United are expanding their South Pacific network, um, so there's a 40% increase in the winter um, on the Trans-Pacific. Um, and actually, again, if we think back to where, where New Zealand was in terms of how closed off it was from the rest of the world, this is a, a, a significant um, a stamp of recovery, isn't it, that we've got um, uh, big volumes of capacity coming back to um, to um, uh, to New Zealand and indeed to South Island. Um, and I was just taking a look back at what capacity had looked like over the last 10 years. And actually what, what we're anticipating is that um, this winter we'll see um, something like uh, just over 700,000 seats a month um, on, in the Trans-Pacific between the US and um, New Zealand. And that's taking us back to 2018, 2019 levels, which is which is great. That's a real indication of um, of, of recovery and optimism, isn't it? In in, in that market, so it's, not, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think the more we dive into this story, um, it, it's um, it's interesting in that yes, it's it's factually true. There's a lot more capacity next winter than than this past winter, um, but actually, it is taking us back to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, it's not a, an increase particularly over that, and and it's when you dig into the numbers, it's um, it also shows that some of those trends we saw before the pandemic are still in play. So we're seeing um, there's more destinations, more um, the, the absolute number of, of routes being flown is, is higher than it was before, but the average aircraft size is smaller. So that sort of more point to point aircraft being able to do long routes um, with smaller loads of passengers um, economically is, is you know, a trend we saw beforehand and, and that's carrying on and, and perhaps um, being extent, accentuated. I, I do wonder if some of this is is what we do with planes that were flying to China, but I haven't looked into that. So um, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, there's there's there, there is that um, there is that sort of unanswered question, isn't there? Maybe we'll maybe we'll revisit that um, in uh, in a blog, or we'll come back to that um, ne next month. Um, okay, so after our uh, diversion down under, um, let's. Um, Let's take a look um, at uh, the picture from your perspective, Louise. Um, so, you, there's optimism, isn't there, um, in in uh, in your mind about, and indeed the data about what what we're going to see this summer. Yeah, there's definitely uh, optimism. Obviously, uh, we are still looking at uh, global volumes behind 2019 levels. Mm -hmm. But I think the important message is that we are getting, uh, and we are getting fast actually to 2019 levels of activity. I don't think this is something we are going to be achieving uh, at a global level this year. We should be looking at next year or within the next two years, and the similar, similar recovery pace uh, than capacity that we were observing in the first slides. Um, but in any case, we are in a much better shape. Well, the industry is in a much better shape than uh, it was one year ago. What we are looking now and what we are going to be looking at in the next slides, it's based on uh, forward keys air ticket data. So we are looking at the traveler demand now and we are looking at the forward tickets uh, issued for traveling in the period June to August. So we can have a sense of how the demand is looking like now for traveling this summer. So at a macro level, we can see that there are some clear uh, winners this year. We have Asia Pacific uh, having a strong comeback, 52% uh, below year to date in the, in the first four months of this year. But uh, after the uh, reactivation of Chinese travel and the gradual uh, acceleration of demand from many of these markets, and particularly for our, from long haul markets, to travel to this region, we are seeing right now an outlook of 26% below uh, 2019 levels. Again, uh, when we think that Europe, the Americas have been relatively <laughs> open for the last couple of years and are still around 16, 18% below 2019 levels, this is a spectacular comeback for the Asian region. Another uh, strong performer for this summer is Africa 
which is also seeing a, a strong boost of demand, particularly coming from uh, European markets. Mm. So I feel that what we are seeing here is a, a strong uh, interest for bucket list destinations. Uh, we see uh, as a continuation of this revenge travel trend that we observed for the last uh, couple of years, like more and more travelers are trying to uh, visit those uh, most, more exclusive destinations that were off limits in the last couple of years. And in Africa, we see destinations like uh, Tanzania or Kenya surpassing already 2019 levels. And that's bucket list safari type travel, isn't it? People, as you say, saying, um, we're, you know, there's no time like the present to actually go and do this once in a lifetime holiday that we um, that we've planned and always wanted to do, and why not? Because who knows if we might be able to do it again. Yeah. Do, do you think there's an element as well that people are substituting um, short haul weekend break type travel for? They're going to say actually we're going to. It's not just a bucket list, but we're going to we're going to do one big trip rather than lots of shorter trips. Is that is that something we're seeing? Indeed, that's an interesting statement because that is uh, something that we can infer from some of the travel indicators. We have been seeing a, a lower proportion of uh, like short, uh, short travels, like we can get away. We can look at some numbers later, but definitely that's an emerging trend. And I feel that that's very much connected with the uh, increase in travel costs, not only related to uh, Airfares, but also connected with uh, accommodation and other travel related services. So, in this current economic climate, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we are seeing how travelers are not really cutting on travel. Uh, we see like many uh, surveys uh, being published in the last uh, month uh, stating that travel, travelers, consumers were not willing to. Uh, Cut that much travel expenses, but maybe what we are seeing is travelers substituting many trips during the year, uh, many short uh, weekend getaways by uh, a longer, bigger, uh, big holiday, and maybe that's what uh, consumers are not willing to sacrifice. Mm. Okay. And just for clarification, these are this is this is tourist arrivals, isn't it? So these are the destinations people are going to, isn't it? Because we've had one or two questions just looking for clarification. And um, yes, it's just international, and it's just these are the arrivals to each of these regions. Yeah. And I think if we go on to our next slide, then we're looking specifically at at some of those uh, sub regions or or the regions within. Um, well, uh, zoom in uh, on the results that we were looking at the previous slide. Again, we are looking at arrivals uh, during the summer period based on the forward tickets. And now we are looking at subregions. So we can see clearly which are the regions that are driving this uh, uh, recovery in the case of, uh, of some regions and a good performance in the case of some other regions. What we see here, uh, just to you know, some key takeaways from this uh, list of uh, destinations. We see Caribbean and Central America being the only regions, sub-regions, that maintain uh, consistently a growth over 2019 levels. This is something that this region managed uh, to uh, maintain over the last, uh, over the last few, uh, few years. We remember that this has been a region that has been very um, permissive when it comes to uh, travel requirements and restrictions and has been extremely popular uh, for the last couple of years for North American travelers and European travelers as well. This region remains in growth mode, but now uh, I think it's interesting to pay more attention to other destinations that uh, ahead of summer 20, uh, 2023 are getting close to uh, the levels of demand of 2019. That's the case of the Middle East, that it's a region that has been uh, uh, achieving good results uh, year to date in recent months, thanks to the excellent performance of uh, destinations like uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and now as well, Egypt is having a strong, uh, strong comeback. I would also like to point to um, the 
again, a spectacular recovery of uh, travel in many Asian Pacific uh, regions, particularly South Asia, and that's obviously uh, India. India is, uh, is a very dynamic market now. We were discussing it uh, the other day. India, not only domestic travel, but international travel, it's showing a strong demand, uh, both outbound travel and inbound travel. We see a lot of uh, BFR-related uh, travel demand for, uh, for India, from mm -hmm. coming from uh, long-haul markets, uh, where there's a like, large uh, Indian community. But we are seeing also India as a popular leisure destination uh, for this uh, summer period. Not only uh, in South Asia we see India, but uh, when we consider that, uh, again, one year ago we were looking at minus 80, minus 70 percent uh, results for uh, other Asian regions. Now looking at Southeast Asia, only 20 percent below uh, 2019 levels is a major achievement. And I feel that these numbers might be slightly underestimating the, the potential of recovery for this region for, uh, for the summer season because I feel that what we are still miss here is the uh, reactivation of Chinese demand. We know that uh, Chinese uh, booking patterns are typically preferring uh, having last minute bookings or booking with short anticipation typically. So we might expect to see the results for these regions, particularly for those destinations that are most dependent on the Chinese market, evolving in the coming months to, uh, to see more and more uh, uh, bookings from the Chinese market as it gradually reactivates. And finally, uh, just uh, commenting on Europe, because we see a very uneven uh, recovery pace. Last year, uh, last summer, we had a we we had a good results. Uh, I would say for uh, particularly Mediterranean destinations, Greece, Portugal, uh, Turkey were the big winners in uh, Europe last year. What we are seeing uh, now, and we will see more in detail uh, in the next slides, is a shift towards more classic mainstream destinations. So we see uh, Spain, France, Italy coming back strongly with uh, like uh, better recovery levels that we observed in last uh, in last summer. But not only that, we also see Northern Europe getting uh, close in terms of recovery to uh, to the to the levels of Southern Europe, and that's particularly thanks to the good performance of destinations like the United Kingdom, Iceland, and the Scandinavian countries as well. So those are the regions I would like to uh, highlight. And uh, I think in a while we're going to be looking at some specific destination and we can comment on some of those trends with more detail. And I think so, some of those that we've talked to, I guess, substantiate or help to substantiate that point about people prioritizing the, you know, the one, the one, the one trip. Um, although it'll be interesting to see, I guess, when we look back at summer, um, 23 what the impact is in it for intra-europe travel because a lot of that has historically been um, short break uh short break travel so yeah interesting um okay so here um I, I, and it was interesting uh, i saw a story um just yesterday i think um where the chief executive of heathrow had um commented that um business travel volumes um by their measure, um, are still being impacted by the economic situation in, in the UK. Um, I think uh, the numbers se seem fairly small, but it's significant enough, I guess, from their perspective, that in the last quarter of 2022, they saw just 28% um, of passengers travelling for business, um, whereas previous, previously to that, it was closer to a third, um, I think 32, just over 32%. So. Um, and and there is this um we stopped talking about it so much now haven't we becca but we've sort of speculated about um there being a portion of the business market that just won't won't come back um and i'm a bit of a skeptic on the subject of business and leisure combined 
maybe that's just grounded in my experience that business trips generally never allow time to have a leisure element. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Um, but I, I, you know, I think there are different things going on, aren't there? There's the trend of people working in, in different places um, and maximizing their leisure time there. There's purportedly a, a trend of people um, uh, taking business trips and adding on a leisure element. That's the bit I'm a bit skeptical about. And then there's just a fundamental different perception, I think, within many big corporates about um, the the rationale for business travel now um, compared to pre. Um, yeah, pre for, for sure. We the, the subject of business travel, we we go around the houses talking about it, and um, I, I'm probably yeah i've come to different views to, to deirdre when we've talked about this before um maybe it's just that my kids are in their 20s and so i see a whole load of their friends going and working in spain working in scotland working you know choosing to work in other parts of the world mexico all sorts of places for you know they base themselves somewhere else um so they can because if they've got a laptop and wi-fi that's all they think they need to work and so you know i, I do sense that there's a, a change um there it may not be a large part of the market i also talk to people in business who say they will not go back to the travel they were doing before so i think we it's it's still a difficult one to gauge what the impact on business has been but i think we can probably see from the efforts that airlines have made to attract the, the premium leisure traveler that actually some of that business travel hasn't come back because they they need the premium leisure travelers so um but it's interesting that you know your chart here lewis shows you know that dip last um last year with covid really you, you know how how an incident can affect certain portions of the market i think it's really interesting and obviously we're not we're not you know i don't think many people are worrying about another um outbreak at this point in time but it does point to how easily the market can be spooked or business travel can be spooked and, and what's really yeah, interesting is right at the end the january numbers you know the clear boost with china reopening uh very as, as we've said before very positive um move mm -hmm. yeah first of all uh, a clarification on the on the methodology we are using here so um for work is uh, analyzing different travel characteristics booking and travel patterns that we characterize as leisure travel and business travel. So we are not only looking at a you know, cabin class here, but we are also looking at a number of variables that give us an indication or an approximation of the different travel behaviors, the different travel purposes. So we can monitor what's the evolution of the uh, you know, business segment as a whole and not specifically linked to, um, to, uh, to that cabin class. So yeah, yeah. I think that one of the positive elements that we see here is that how the business travel has been closing the gap with leisure travel. Obviously, leisure travel recovery has been moving faster, but particularly in 2022, which was the year that we first witnessed uh, uh, like many regions, like main regions in uh, North America, Europe with a strong weight on the on the global business travel lifting all the travel requirements uh, we see live events uh, returning so that's why we see this acceleration of the business recovery uh, uh, during 2022 you were coming about you were talking about the, the this bump uh, related to the omicron but i think one positive element there is that how quickly the demand recovered pre omicron levels as soon as this uh, short period of uh, restrictions uh, recovered. So basically, what we are seeing here is that business travel is uh, is coming back uh, is coming back as soon as the travel environment is uh, safe to travel again, with no surprises, with no travel requirements or no like changes of uh, you know cancellations of events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, think a big I think question that in the industry okay. is uh, something you addressed. Uh, it's uh, whether we are going to get to the same level of business travel activity as we had in 2019. Many industry voices claim that we are never going to uh, get back to the same number because of the changing uh, working habits, uh, work culture, and uh, some other emerging trends like uh, you know, remote working, 
like uh, digital nomadism, like uh, like uh, online events and so on. The fact is that we still see this trend of recovery going up. And now the reopening of China uh, triggered an additional boost in the recovery of business travel towards 2019 levels. So for the moment, I think that we can still be uh, optimistic about the pace of recovery. We might see a uh, slowing down or stagnating at some point, actually for the last quarter, well, I would say the last half, uh, the second half of 2022, we observed uh, an stagnation of the recovery of both leisure travel and business travel. I believe this is strongly connected to some of the uh, industry uh, disruptions that we observed in summer related mm -hmm. to uh, you know, airport uh, chaos, cancellations of flights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like the, the, the industry not being able to uh, to uh, uh, satisfy the the strong demand, and uh, some uh, like uh, damage being made to the consumer confidence. That would be one factor. Another big factor I think that we should be looking into 2023 is the uh, economic climate, particularly for a, a region like Europe. We see rising inflation in the second half of last year. There was a you know, great concern about uh, the economic outlook for a winter season and for the following year. Uh, we are not in, a, in, a, in a, such a bad shape as uh, some outlooks uh, last year were, were, uh, were claiming. But in any case, I think that we should be, um, we should be optimistic, but we also should be cautious about the economic climate because that could be one of the factors that is going to be uh, slowing down uh, or stagnating at some point the recovery the recovery particularly of leisure travel that's the that's the watchword of covid isn't it cautious optimism <laughs> okay um i'm conscious of time and we've got a few more slides to to cover so um let's uh, let's move on to our next one which is um as billed at, at the start where are travelers going this summer um and this is an interesting list isn't it um of um some markets that are performing or, or anticipated to perform very well um versus some others that that, that are still not um you know not, not quite delivering what we might expect um but it's all relative isn't it because actually um, I guess in the context of what, what we've said so far versus 2019, the, the, there is still, you know, there's still a, a reasonably strong picture. Right. I think we have a very, uh, very, like very important messages uh, uh, relative to different regions. First of all, I think it's uh, again uh, spectacular the uh, comeback of some Asian destinations. We see the Philippines going from minus 40 year to date in the first four months to having a growth outlook for the summer period uh, that means tickets right now surpassing the level of tickets for a uh, summer 2019 as of uh, end of april i think that's spectacular that's great news and not only for philippines but we also see india we also see south korea and we also see indonesia in this uh, slide so that's a spectacular comeback again for uh, these Asian destinations, and this uh, no, it's, it's showing the strong uh, pent-up demand uh, and also revenge travel. That means that fares are not such uh, an important factor when we have pent-up demand not, for destinations. They're not like dampening that. demand, are they? That's that's. I think that's that's what we're seeing. And I think what's really interesting is that that point you make that actually, if we'd looked at this probably even three months ago, um, there would not have been the Asian de destinations in in the list that we're seeing uh, we're seeing today. I think the other interesting thing is um, Greece has performed well throughout, hasn't it? You know, it was a destination that. Um, more or less remained open um, for, for tourism and proactively sought, perhaps, perhaps didn't get the same headlines um, that Mexico did um, or, or that, um, you know, some other destinations did, but actually 
um, I think that's borne out now, isn't it, in, in terms of its, its position, its your and your position, strong. Yeah, the position of Greece, I think it's uh, worth uh, mentioning because it's the destination that managed to maintain leadership. When we look at last summer uh, and the previous summer for the last couple of summers, we had uh, an absolute dominance of Caribbean destinations, but we also had some outliers in the Mediterranean. Greece was one of them, Portugal and Turkey. Now we see Greece keeping the first position in the list of top destinations sorted by, uh, by growth. That means that Greece did a great job by, but, but about developing their market and not only managing to growth uh, during this period of uncertainty and uh, low consumer confidence, but also to retain these uh, travelers, uh, to, to, to maintain this leadership in this summer where the competition is more fragmented. We don't see uh, Turkey uh, in the list anymore. Uh, it was one of the, again, uh, high on the charts with uh, Greece uh, in the last years. In the case of Turkey, we see a slowdown of the demand uh, because of uh, first uh, the absence of uh, demand from Russia that was very strong this year. In this year, the Russian economy is, is, uh, is struggling. The rubble is, uh, is, has devaluated significantly in comparison to the value it had uh, last summer. So we are seeing less of Russian demand, which is a fundamental market for Turkey. And most importantly, Turkey has, is still suffering from the impact that the earthquake had on, uh, had on its uh, uh, travel demand earlier this year. We see that ever since this tragic event, uh, the demand for Turkey has uh, slowed down and it's not uh, fully recovered yet. There's still time for the summer. I believe that uh, Turkey can still recover. But in any case, what we see in, the, in, the, in this list is uh, much, uh, much more uh, challengers uh, this year. We have a more fragmented uh, competition. Basically, all uh, travel restrictions are lifted now. So we see destinations that, again, classic mainstream destinations like uh, France, Italy, making it again to the top of the list. Uh, we see less Caribbean destinations that you know were kind of more niche destinations, but were extremely popular during the during uh, during the last years. And now we are seeing again United Kingdom, Canada, Spain, Switzerland. Uh, we see a more diverse and varied uh, demand for for destinations, and we see again very classic destinations that you know struggle to uh, attract travelers in the last years. Again, making it uh, to the top of the list. So again, I think this is connecting very much with what we were discussing before about you know this bucket list travel. Like the, you know, travelers are now maybe uh, traveling less, but you know, kind of willing to spend more uh, as long as it's uh, one of the big trips that you must do in your lifetime. And uh, and that's a that's a positive uh, situation for these classic uh, destinations that are now coming back to the top destination list for this summer. Another uh, destinations that are absent from this list, but I think it's worth also commenting on, are Vietnam, Thailand, and other mainstream uh, Southeast Asian destinations. And the reason that why they are not in this list is because they are still uh, not having a, having a good a, a good recovery uh, in respect to 2019, similar to other Asian destinations, but these destinations are still suffering from the absence of the Chinese uh, Chinese uh, yeah. travelers, uh, the Chinese the, bookings. If we looked those, at the if we looked at the profile of those destinations in terms of their top source markets, China China yeah. is number one across probably um, I think almost all of the Southeast Asian destinations. So that's um, yeah, that's that's something I think. Let's let's watch the next quarter, um, or maybe the last quarter of uh, of twenty twenty three, and see if that um, if that uh, changes. Um, I'm I am conscious of time again, so um, we uh, we're, we're at five minutes um, to go. So I think we'll um, we'll focus. We've got a couple more slides. 
um, we have a few more slides, but I don't think we're going to get through all of them. I think what is interesting, Louise, if I can come to the next slide, is the extent to which um, currency issues um, and um, the degree of recovery beyond that sort of initial surge is actually shaping um, outbound, uh, outbound travel demand. Um, you know, we're, what we saw last summer with strong growth um, from the US into um, into Europe because of the strength of the dollar, um, we're we're still seeing, aren't we? You know that 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 is still happening um, this summer, and that's we're expecting that to to continue, aren't we? Uh, we saw uh, we're actually monitoring the the, the demand of uh, U.S. travel against the currency fluctuations. Last summer was very favorable for the North Americans to travel to Europe. Uh, there was also strong pent up demand because restrictions were like recently lifted, had been recently lifted. And again, the U.S. had a strong position against the euro. We are seeing that the euro is again gaining value against the dollar, but still this uh, this demand from the U.S. market is, uh, is still resilient for European destinations. I would say that the main factor now uh, that, that European destinations and not only European destinations have to uh, consider this year is that now they have more competition. I think that's the main, the key message for this summer. There's more competition this year. We are seeing uh, uh, outbound demand from uh, North American markets, the US, and finally Canada is uh, is in green numbers again in outbound travel. So that's great news. Uh, the only thing is that if last year that demand was uh, mainly uh, focusing on the Caribbean and Europe, now they have uh, more options. And now we are seeing more and more demand for South America, for Asia, Southeast Asia particularly, um, Africa in the case of Europe. So we are seeing, uh, it's, uh, we are getting back to this competitive situation of the, of the destinations where uh, the, it's going to be harder to capture these travelers, particularly considering the, uh, the current environment with higher airfares and in some occasions, some uh, still connectivity issues or, uh, or seat capacity not fully restored uh, when connecting some, uh, some regions of the world to other regions. And I guess this is, you know, go back to the slide we showed earlier, the sort of slightly anomalous one about United adding more routes and uh, flights down to uh, Australia and New Zealand. I guess this is the challenge for the airlines, isn't it? Trying to anticipate where people are going to want to go, how that competition between destinations shakes up and how they they then respond with with where they're going to put their, their fleet. Um, so what you're saying here, your analysis sort of bears out the sort of thing we're seeing in the um, activity in the market by, by carriers like United. I think um, I think we have time maybe just for uh, one more um, one more slide. Um, Everybody will get the complete slide deck, won't they? Though, so there's uh, yeah. they'll get to see the other slides that we were going to talk about. Yeah, we may we may be able to squeeze in uh, maybe able to squeeze in two more if we um, if we talk uh, quickly. But to some extent, we've we've sort of covered this, haven't we? Um, you know, in terms of nobody wants a repeat of last summer. Um, and um, I, I think, uh, yeah, so, so maybe um, unless there's anything we want to add specifically to, to, to this slide, um, you know, I, I think- I think this is the point I spoke about earlier, isn't it? That, you know, this, when, when Lewis showed us this yesterday, I, I was really interested in, you know, you have airport disruption in July and this is um, bookings that take place in July, isn't it? And, and just the instant impact that that had in terms of where people, um, you know, what, what people book. And, and it doesn't necessarily pick up later. You don't recover that loss later. Um, it just returns, the, the booking pattern returns to perhaps where it would have been before. So yes, there's a quick recovery from this as we also saw with the, the business bookings earlier for um, the Omicron, but it, it's quite a big hit to take in the middle of the summer. And this is why the airlines really need to be on top of the capacity, on top of disruption, have a bit of buffer in their schedules so that if there are issues, they can manage it so that we, we don't see that sort of disruption that then affects the bookings as well. Um, yeah, very, very strong. Yeah, that, that had a strong impact in consumer confidence. So as we can see here, it's not only the dip in bookings as soon as this, uh, you know, a story about 
flight cancellations, airport queues, and all this chaos was making the headlines for uh, consistently every week uh, in the you know travel peak uh, mm -hmm. season. It's not only that, but uh, the fact that in the following months, uh, the damage to consumer confidence was dragging this recovery. And actually, we see that bookings didn't really recover this upward trend that was uh, happening in the first part of the year. Of course, we also need to connect that with inflation, but we also had inflation in the first part of the year, and still we see we saw uh, bookings uh, like uh, recovering really fast. So I think that consumer confidence uh, is a fundamental factor for uh, continue recovering this pre-pandemic demand. And uh, on that, airlines and airports, like any all travel operators, have an important role to play. And I think that also ha has a relationship to what we were talking about earlier, doesn't it? In terms of um, the length of stay point, that you know, if if your fear is that you're going to be disrupted um, on a you know on a weekend break to Europe um, or, or you know a sort of two night stay somewhere then weighing up whether that that you want to spend more of that time in an airport than actually exploring the destination um pushes you more into let's maximize the the, the time and take a longer trip and just not 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 do as many um and that's kind of borne out isn't it in in the data you're, sh you're showing here um not necessarily the rationale for that but you know the the numbers are showing an increase in those longer stays and a decrease in the in the shorter trips, which is really interesting, I think. Um, you can see here that short trips in Europe uh, are shrinking in, in, in terms of weight. And this is connecting with what we were discussing before. And just to give you a fact, a kind of to complement this information, we are also seeing that the average uh, fare for a, for a leisure ticket has increased of four, by 14% uh, over 2019. So we are seeing an like consistent increase in airfares, and not only airfares, but we also see an increase in accommodation prices. So I think at the end of the day, consumers want to travel, but uh, the current conditions are kind of pushing towards these uh, these uh, like behavioral change towards like saving for the big trip and cutting on like uh, other shorter trips. Yeah. I think that we also should consider more for the longer term, this uh, rising trend on sustainability concerns, uh, because I feel that particularly in Europe, we see more and more consumers kind of more uh, mindful about the, the impact, the environmental impact of their, uh, of their habits. So that over time, you know, might be also uh, one of the reasons driving this a reduction of uh, short weekend getaways and preference for longer trips and longer stays. Yeah, and really making making the most of um, uh, just just maximizing your, your your trip there and then. I think um, just for those of you who are who are still hanging on hanging on uh, in there with us, I know we're we're just past four o'clock. Um, we've got one final slide. I know I've said that three times now. I think that we'd like to just very quickly show you. If you do have to drop off, everybody will get a copy of the recording, um, so you can uh, you can delve into that to to hear um, any interesting snippets in our our sort of final um, our final part of the discussion. But I would like us just to show um, very quickly this uh, this slide, um, which uh, is about China uh, China outbound. Still a question that is of of huge interest right across the industry. Um, both, um, you know, both in Europe and North America, from the perspective of um, Chinese outbound travelers being important, uh, high spending um, contributors to um, to tourism uh, figures, and of course, um, right across uh, Asia as well. So this is interesting. So um, as we said, there's a there's a holiday. Um, we're in holiday season. Um, in China at the moment, um, and I think there's a sort of sense, isn't there, Louise, that this will be an indication of the appetite and the level of demand um, for for uh, for outbound travel from from China, given that this is really the first proper occasion that people have had the chance to do it since 2019. 
I think this could be the, the first indication we get because uh, I think Chinese market was not ready to uh, for the Chinese New Year holiday period. It was like very short notice uh, about the reopening. There was this kind of wave of um, of uh, this outbreak of COVID in China. So uh, this is the first holiday period, like like big holiday period, that where we can see how Chinese demand uh, behaves. In any case, the Labor Day holiday it's typically uh, it's typically a very regional uh, holiday travel season uh, because it's not a very long holiday. Uh, it's an extended holiday. In this occasion, it's, the dates are quite convenient to take a, a quite break. So what basically what we are seeing here it's fundamentally uh, like regional travel. We see uh, some destinations, long haul destinations. Uh, uh, getting good, like good results, relative, good, relatively good results, like like getting closer to 50% of 2019 levels. But we should be aware that the proportion of Chinese travel outside of Asia in in this period is relatively small. We are talking about a 3% of total uh, Chinese outbound travel. So I think it's uh, in this case more relevant to focus on what's going on in Asia uh, in these results, and what we see is like fundamentally like proximity destinations such as Macau, Hong Kong uh, are the ones uh, seeing uh, like are the first choice, are the ones that are uh, having a greater recovery. In the case of Macau for the first time seeing growth over 2019. But we are still many other destinations, Indonesia, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, South Korea, Thailand, still quite far from the volumes they had uh, in 2019. So that's why I'm still a bit cautious about uh, the, the recovery of China. I think that we are going to see a much better performance for the summer. But I think that we still need to see to see that reactivation. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a, a market that typically has a very short lead time. They would typically uh, book one or two months in advance uh, for their summer trips, and anything that happens until until then, it's going to be very, uh, very, um, very ha having a strong impact on the decision of Chinese consumers. It's it's, it's fundamental uh, in terms of messaging, in terms of connectivity, in terms of industry readiness, uh, like flight connections, seat capacity and also in terms of airfares. I think those are factors that need to be ready in place and, uh, and, and properly communicated to the Chinese consumers ahead of the summer season for a, for a good result. It, it, I mean, it, it, I, I think it's more positive perhaps than you're saying, given that at the start of the year, we had virtually no international travel. So to be at minus 50% or minus 44% between the beginning of the year and we're not even at the end of April, to me seems remarkable given how long it's taken um, other countries to to bring those their markets back and it, it, as you say it's a short booking uh, window for for outbound Chinese travel so if Labor Day goes well um, then it seems to me that there's lots of potential for um, the rest of South of, of Asia to see the benefit in the, in the coming months isn't there yeah, correct. I think that for summer, we are still need to see what's going to happen, but I think that there's a lot of potential. It took us, for some regions, it took like a year or two to get to this minus 50, minus 60 percent. So that's definitely a, a fast comeback. It's not often I um, uh, forget have, to unmute myself, but there we are. I the think, um, yeah, no, I think, I think we're, um, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, I, I think uh, it, it, you know, it certainly feels to me like we're in a much more optimistic place than we were. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the summer brings, um, just in terms of um, to, to what extent um, China really delivers on what we all know the, the, the potential potential is. And then I think that starts to um, bring into play, um, you know, a reopening of, of um, China to the to the rest of the world beyond beyond Asia. But let's see how um, let's see how it how it pans out. I think we'll all be watching with interest. Thank you so much, um, Luis, for joining us for your for your fascinating insights. Um, clearly, 
you're as uh, interested in um, aviation data as we are. It's always good to, to be in, uh, in, in good company. Um, so thanks very much for, um, for joining us and thanks, Becca. Um, and we'll see you back here um, in a month's time for uh, the, next, the next webinar. Thanks everybody for, um, for listening today. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Bye.